p.m., dog loose on Summer Street, 6.20 p.m., double-headed meter stolen on River Street, 8.58 p.m., bear reported in Terrace Street Yard. It was still there early the next morning, or had returned after being scared off by the trooper who responded to George Mason's call, and it reappeared several times the following week. A medium-sized black she-bear, dull-eyed and mangy from her recent hibernation, and obviously ravenous. It was unclear what had drawn her to that particular yard, though the Mason house was at the end of Terrace, a dead-end street on the northeastern edge of town beyond which there was nothing but several hundred acres of forest, and beyond that the boggy remains of Gone Away Lake. Acres and acres of nothing, which is to say everything a black bear might find desirable. Acres and acres of tamarack and black spruce, balsam fir and white cedar, silvery hemlock in the cool, shady ravines, sphagnum moss and cinnamon fern, jewelweed and nettles, wither rod and nanny berry, fish, lots of fish, a beautiful black salamander with yellow spots hiding in the leaf mold under a fallen cottonwood. Monday night was a half moon, Wednesday waxing gibbous. The bear removed the lids from all of George Mason's recycling <coughs> bins and licked out the insides of the spaghetti sauce jars George hadn't washed thoroughly enough also the mushroom and chicken noodle soup cans. She made a mess of the newspaper, some of which ended up Thursday morning plastered against the front of the Canfields house across the street, a cold front from the Canadian Maritimes having arrived around midnight, bringing with it wind and rain. Thursday night was clear and bright. The bear sat on her haunches in the middle of George Mason's yard. She looked like an old man in a sweater, George thought, peering at her through the curtains over the kitchen sink. Like his father, which is to say, not cute, not adorable, but full of pent-up anger that could be released at the drop of a hat. Where did the bear come from? What was she doing there? Of course, beyond the acres and acres of forest, there was the world. The world with its houses and cities, its people, machinery, weapons, germs, and noise. Something always encroaching from somewhere encroaching and pushing until something else had to give, until it had to shoot loose like a storm of invective from a father's mouth or a weapon from an underground silo. There was only so much room. Eventually, George began putting honey out for the bear. He would pour it into a cereal bowl that he would set inside the otherwise empty newspaper recycling bin and then tightly replace the lid. He loved to watch the whole operation, but in particular the deft way the bear opened the lid and then paused for a fraction of an instant before looking inside the bin, as if to dwell for a moment in that happy place where almost anything is possible. Mies folded her hands. She bowed her head and seemed to close her eyes, but left slits to look through. Mr. Banner was looking back at her, his heavy black-rimmed glasses and the brilliant orb of his hairless head catching the last sunlight that came through the window over the sideboard. Looking back at her with a puzzled and cagey expression on his face, a very strange disposition, Mr. Banner's. What was he thinking? You didn't imagine it, Meese told him with her brain, but it's a secret. Shh. Spring breezes and the whooshing sounds of skateboards on the sidewalk. The Banners lived in town, two blocks up Main Street from the Crockett home for the aged. Car stereos, boom, 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 bells ringing, bong, 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 the devil god, the devil god, nothing fancy. For what we are about to receive, Mrs. Banner said, may the Lord make us truly grateful. She was a religious person of 60 or so with long gray hair that she wore in pigtails and a relentlessly pleasant expression that made you think eternity would be exhausting. At least they hadn't had to join hands like at Ginny Makepeace's house. Sonny, would you kindly pass the gravy, asked Mr. Banner. Lorna, may I help you to some roast beef? 
He was a man plucked from the jaws of death, a man given a second chance, a man who couldn't stop talking about the kind of man he now was. It's going to be different around here, Mr. Banner was exulting. Didn't I say, Glenda? Help yourself to some of Mrs. Banner's mashed potatoes, girls. No one makes mashed potatoes like Glenda. On the school bus the next day, when Sonny repeated this last sentence in a sonorous voice, opening her small blue eyes as wide as possible and ducking her chin into her neck, Mies pretended to gag, and Lorna, tender-hearted Lorna, who sometimes cried over the faces of the men in the wanted posters in the post office, twisted across the back of the seat in front of them to object. Just because we saved his life doesn't mean we have to like him, Mies pointed out. For the moment, though, Mies was behaving herself, having been instructed to do so by her mother, who also happened to be the person who'd made her accept Mr. Banner's invitation in the first place. It had been such a nice day, a day when you could pack a lunch and head into Fair's Woods and no one would ask any questions, and you and Margaret could stay as long as you wanted, assuming, that is, you didn't have to be packed off to town in a dress of all things to eat dinner with people you barely knew at a ridiculously early hour. A perfect day, Mies thought. The trail, sun-splotched and shadowy, and down you'd go past the five erratics, and the next thing you knew, there'd be that first little invisible hand slipping shyly into yours, but so shyly to begin with, it wasn't so much like slipping into as slipping through. Your gravy is very good, Mrs. Banner, Sonny said. The hallmark of a great chef, said Lorna, adding that that was what her dad always said, though Mr. Fine never took his head out of the newspaper long enough to see what he was eating, and Mies figured that, as usual, Lorna had gotten the line from a book. A great chef, repeated Mr. Banner. I like that. Are you going to let the girls in on your secret, Glenda, he asked. I thought you said it was going to be different around here, Mrs. Banner replied, cutting her roast beef into tiny pieces, as if there were an infant hidden away waiting to be fed. She had a very high-pitched voice, the exact opposite of Mr. Banner's. Mrs. Banner's voice was like the hot evening breeze coming through the window over the sideboard, parting to make its way around the roast. A hot breeze with a lot of floral aromas in it, whereas Mr. Banner's voice was like the roast, overdone and hard to chew and clogged with blood and fat. When you did a Saturday night sleepover at Sonny's, everyone went to church the next morning, and so Mies also knew what Mrs. Banner's voice sounded like, singing. The only one in the choir who could, according to Sonny's dad, though he usually slept through the entire service. Speckled brown and gold wallpaper, a mahogany sideboard, a mahogany break front, filled with many different kinds of dishes and ceramic figurines, including several Indian maidens, and on either side of the arched doorway into the living room, a very tall snake plant in a brass pot, a spinet piano with a fireside book of folk songs open to the foggy, foggy dew. The room smelled like potatoes and varnish and baby powder, though they weren't having potatoes but Lasur canned peas, which Mies recognized because that was the only thing her sister Mercy would eat after one of her migraines, unheated straight from the can. Over the piano, there was a large oil painting of a naked woman with a sort of blurry face and very large boobs reclining on a sofa. You didn't know I was a painter, did you? Mr. Banner challenged when he saw Mies looking at it, adding that there was nothing more beautiful on God's earth than the female form. Then he excused himself and went into the kitchen to refill the yellow aluminum water pitcher. The gravy's from a package, Mrs. Banner said the minute he was gone. She looked around the table without making eye contact. But don't tell that I told, she added, blushing. And then Mr. Banner was back with the yellow pitcher, and Mies was whispering, I don't get it. And Lorna was whispering, shh. And Mrs. Banner was saying, so, are any of you girls natives originally? My mom's from here, said Sonny. She met my dad on spring break in Fort Lauderdale. He's from Massachusetts. Fort Lauderdale, Mr. Banner mused. I was there once. Excellent sand beaches. I was born here, said Lorna, but my parents are both from New 